Tony Mitchell, it's 20 years ago since you made your first album and you've come such a long way from there, you know, through all kinds of, of music. And this last album seems to be a mixture of both jazz and folk and rock and everything you've been through. Is that how you feel it? Um, yeah, I feel at this point, like, um, from time to time, the river of my music needed the introduction of new tributaries, you know. Um, and this album in particular, I guess, is a kind of a potpourri of styles. It gets very folky on the last track, and and there's a lot of continuing synthesizer experiment. I guess you would say it's a synopsis, a roundup of different styles. And you've chosen to work with Peter Gabriel. How did that come about? Um, well, at the beginning of the project, before I began to record, my husband was working in the southwest of England, uh, with Ben Orr. He was producing Ben Orr's record. And news got out that he was in the neighborhood, and Peter sent for him to play bass on his album. And um, when I arrived, I had two new songs which I wanted to record. I was going to borrow time from the boys on the weekends when they weren't working. Um, Peter's st studio, which was 40 miles away, was standing empty. So he offered it to me. Uh, he said, look, you know, I'm, I've just finished my album. There's no one in there, you, you know, why don't you just come and use this facility? And while I was there, he, of course, stuck his head in to see how I was doing from time to time. And so I said, how would you like to sing on this song? So this is how it came about, just by accident, really, naturally. I'm gonna take you. It's very subtle, the way that you've used him. It's almost like you just slip him into a Joni Mitchell song. It, um, the idea came to me when, when he began to sing, he studied my phrasing, and the timbre of his voice in that particular register was not typical of Peter. Um, so I remembered the Song of Solomon in the Bible, where something has either happened in the translation or it was written in a way that you can't tell what gender it is, that it keeps undulating between a man's point of view and a woman's point of view. So when it came to the editing of where his vocal and my vocal would be, I changed from my voice to his, sometimes in the middle of a word, you know. I think it's kind of nice that way. Mm. It becomes then like the inner communal thoughts of a couple instead of boy singing to girl, girl singing to boy, you know. Mm. Yeah. Lyrically, you've also been very, very personal from time to time, almost painfully so. Has that been difficult for you to expose yourself so directly in your lyrics? No, I, I've always felt that um, human nature is human nature and, and that that uh, the human experience, if well depicted, in, in you know, that it was worth the sacrifice you know, people had the option then to to either... Nothing that I said about myself was that specifically me. I mean, I think most people have felt those things that I exposed about myself. So, um, but they had the option in listening to say, oh, that's how Joni feels, or I feel that way too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's 20 years ago, uh, 1968 these days, and it's been lot of celebrating and lot of myths going on about that time. How do you think about that time now, musically, when you look back? The 60s? Yeah. What aspect of it? Gee, that's a big question. I know. But I think the area around 68, 69, when it was all the big folk festivals, and, and it seems to me that a lot of people have a lot of um, romantic notions about what that was really like. Well, it was colourful. You know, the manner of dress was very... Um, savage and tribal and um, these gatherings had an air of pageantry about them. Mm -hmm. um, they look very strange now if you look back on them, people with shaved heads and colors painted all over their faces. There was a story told to me at one time about, it was an Indian story, I don't know whether it's truth or fiction, but I always liked it and it served well as an explanation for the hippie phenomenon in America. Um, and that was that at the end of some battle, a chief raised up on the battlefield in his death throes on one elbow and seeing his slaughtered young 
uh, cursed the white soldiers departing and said, you know, may the souls of our dead come back in your generations to haunt you. And so the very um, Indian emulating aspect of the hippie culture, you know, the savage paint and the long hair and the bandanas around the head and the, the love of nature and uh, all of that, I always wondered if, if that wasn't kind of a fulfillment of prophecy. At that time, there were lots of stories about you being very vulnerable when you were on stage, that you break into tears on during a concert. Is that, is that true? Oh, yeah. Well, see, I was the sacrificial folky, in a way. <laughs> I would be um, presented at these large rock festivals, standing in front of somebody else's mountain of amps. My audience was small and devoted, and frequently they would push forward. I'm thinking in particular of one occasion. I could see, because I'm at an elevation, people coming from here and here and here, trying to get closer. Mm -hmm. They created a commotion in the audience, which brought the cops out along the edge of the stage. All the time I'm singing very, very intimate. It's not like I have a band to face off and like party with. I'm drawing emotions up from my insides in the face of chaos. So this happened to me on more than one occasion. And, you know, either I would burst into tears or run. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is true. Was it a tough time? Well, not, not, these were tough moments, but it wasn't so much of a tough time. I just never fared well in big festivals. It wasn't, my work was too intimate. Mm. Imagine yourself trying to carry on a conversation, you're speaking. I mean, here you are on your podium, supposedly you have something to say, and you're looking out frequently at pandemonium. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes absurd, you know, and the animal has adrenaline given to it to fight or to flee, and you have seconds to assess it, and if you don't do either one, if you, ne if you neither get bigger than life or run, you get kinetic. Mm -hmm. Your whole body starts to go into arrest and trembling, you know. So I usually assessed it and said, no, I'm not big enough to stand, so I would take off. <laughs> <laughs> People have had a lot of emotions about what you need to eat, like when you did the Mingus album. There were lots of talk, and now she's going into jazz, and people were very angry and felt very strongly about it. Why do you think that is? Well, people were afraid of jazz, I think, as... as uh, people are afraid of things they don't understand. Uh, in the rock community, I know my peer group was afraid of my playing with jazz musicians. They took it as a kind of a personal betrayal. They used to ridicule me for it, and... and uh, some of them felt that I had pretensions to something that I wasn't, but, you know, it's typecasting, really. I mean, w when I was a kid in my in my teens, I loved to dance. You know, I was a rock and roll, mindless, happy-go-lucky dancing type. So you can imagine what that community of friends thought of me when suddenly I'm a folky and I'm singing these, like, intimate little... They say, what happened to her? But the people who met me when I was singing like that... Then when I went into jazz, they couldn't relate. So, I mean, if, if you're going to let people rule your life, you'll never come to your full development. Has the jazz period, has that changed the way that you see rock today? The way I see rock today? Hmm. Well, I like rock and roll better than rock. Mm -hmm. The role of it is, like, rock and roll to me is... The push beat. Mm -hmm. And rock is like, you know, the, the, the swing. The absence of that joyous spirit, which died in the 60s, uh, I miss. Like, I like boogie woogie. I like rock and roll. I like some rock, but rock is very vertical and very white, and the white history of drumming is martial. And the 60s were a very war-oriented people. The singers had anxiety on their face and the drum was white militant, you know. Mm. I like that period of rock and roll's history probably the least. Um, I even liked it better when it hit the 80s and it was ning, 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 this neurotic little beat I like better <laughs> than, than the anxious militant beat of rock and roll in the 60s. 
um, with, with a few exceptions. You know, of course, the giants, the geniuses like Jimi Hendrix and, and Sly, to me, those are the great talents for me of the, of the 60s. But rock and roll was born in a black idiom, and it was, it was a saucy kind of thing, you know. It was designed to get your spirits high, and then it became this militant alarm ringing. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is what I like outside of my own music. I'm not talking now at all about my own music. Mm -hmm. you know. When you were in the Canadian Band Aid, I also read somewhere that you said that you weren't really for those kind of things, the kind of events, like, like the Band Aid, that it was... Um, that I wasn't for them? Well, that, that you <coughs> had some, some opinions about maybe people used it more for their own fame than actually for somebody else's famine. Oh, and frequently the money never gets to the cause. Uh -huh. You know, they are a bit of a self-congratulatory... They, I think they do more to make heroes out of the people who support them than they actually do for the event. That's been proven. For instance, the Bangladesh, you know, which was Dylan and George Harrison, um, there was a tremendous amount of celebration, and of course they were elevated as humanitarians and so on. The money never got there. It just came out of escrow a few years ago. So there is... But, but I'm not against these things. I still think that, that they... Uh, that the, they do so much less than they seem to do, but that little that they do, as trivial as it is, you know, as minuscule, is important. I'm not against them, no. It's just that the reality of them is there's so much less than they are, seem to be. When you wrote the song Ethiopia, had you been there, or was it just through what you heard on the news? Every night on, on Sunday, uh, Sunday night television in the States, um, there were a series of evangelical broadcasts, and the last one was really bait for bleeding hearts. I mean, it was ripe for scamming and possibly was a scam. And there they would show, you know, these poor and desperate people, and there would be a man and a woman, she dressed in Rodeo Boulevard safari suits, silk safari suits wandering through. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty awful. I mean, you, you know, and they would flash the number of the telephone number where you could send money, you know, and uh, again, you know, at, at the risk of sounding like a cynic, you know, um, I don't, I don't think I am, I don't live in cynicism, you know, um, part of what may sound cynical is factual, so it's more... These things are difficult, you know. Mm. I'm very empathetic with the Ethiopian people, but it has to run the gauntlet of their very corrupt government, bad organization to get the food to them in the first place, the fact that the government basically wants these people destroyed, and there is a kind of a genocide at work. Um, difficult, uh, very difficult. Do you feel more cynical now? I don't think, in defense of my point of view, it is fairly well informed. Mm. I think cynicism, I think I have my moments of cynicism where my realism is exaggerated and flippant. Mm. But I think that it's based on unfortunate fact. A lot of your lyrics have been about your troubled relationships with men. Do you feel that you shift a bit now, that you, you emphasize different things in your lyrics? Um, well, I did write about the anatomy of the crime, you know, a, a lot, about people's inability to really love and their mistaken knowledge of what love is. Again, um, people are taught in these cultures how to to be sexy. There's a lot of emphasis on being sexy and very little emphasis on loving, mm. you know. Um, so my, that has been a constant theme with me. Um, and I made it kind of my life's work to figure out what love was, to analyze my capacity for it, hopefully to increase my capacity for it, 
always with the optimism that if I was properly prepared and was capable of loving, that love would come to me. I'm happily married now. So um, it gives me space to turn to other themes. Do you think an album like Blue could have been made today? Not against the cynical climate of the 80s where it's chic to be, uh, to insult the artists. You know, I mean, I took some flack back then for writing that intimately, but, but not of the viciousness that, that accompanied journalism at the onset of this decade. Were I young and writing like that at the onset of this decade, and what I could imagine they would have done with that, oh, I don't think I would have survived it. I would have gone back in my shell and would never have had the courage to continue. Well, I don't know. Maybe I would have. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say because it's all hypo hypothetical. I know in Montreal I just gave some interviews and there the, the interviewers were encouraging me to write another album like that and that's what I said to them are you kidding you know you, you know you guys would pin me to the wall if I reveal like these kind of vulnerable things you know to be vulnerable in the 80s is death itself isn't it I mean the whole world is striving to be hip and cool and duh, you know like and well defended well, that doesn't leave much for music though doesn't it no it, it makes music have a lot of posturing and not much real human spirit but a lot of posing and posturing I'm bad, I'm bad <laughs> <laughs> It's not your favorite record is it? No, no, I like that I really see it, that's terrible you know, but I mean it's, it's typical of how we must present ourselves in order to be hip in this decade you know don't mess with me because I'm well defended you would never go, you know like Please be my friend, I'm not very well defended. You wouldn't offer yourself for it. No, they'd eat you alive, wouldn't you think? Mm. I think so. I read that you said sometime that um, the intellect was a very overrated instrument that you'd rather work from intuition. Is that how you still work? Well, my, my intuition, I think, is, is more accurate than my intellect. My, in, my instinct will tell me, you know, first of all, like instinct... Is like, is like a computer chip. It's like Shakespeare on a pinhead. You get a lot of information very fast. And now if you want to expand on that, you would have to go to your intellect to expand it, to tell, but you would know that fast with instinct, a tremendous amount. And if somebody said, what are you thinking? You have to now go to intellect to tell it. Mm -hmm. You know, So it's slower. Intellect is a lot slower. You can learn this fast. And sometimes intellect too will tell you, gets mixed up with image and all. It's slower and stupider. <laughs> 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 it's, it's a good tool, but it's linear and analytical. And it, you know, it, reason is like revered as being, you know, the great standard. You know, um, I think it's a wonderful tool, but highly overrated. You know, like I think that there are other ways that, that, that knowledge comes that are clearer and quicker and they can't necessarily be explained. So if, if people say to you that you are an intellectual artist, would you like that or would you not? It's not true. So, so where will you go from here? What will be your next step? I don't know. We, Peter, my manager, and I were just talking about that today. You know, there's a lot of plays, ways I could go from one extreme to the other. For instance, the song I, I have some new songs which sound nice, just voice and guitar. I could go that direction. Um, I still have the desire to get further and further into symphonic composition because the synthesizers afford me as an illiterate musician the ability to hands-on compose these things that I hear but can't write on the staff. Eh? So um, 
I could go I could go off in any direction. I also we've just put a studio in our house and I've talked to Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and mm -hmm. friends of mine about um, just coming over to the house some night for supper and jamming. So I could go off in that direction. I've talked with Prince at one point about doing funk with my open tunings, you know, but taking a funk beat and then these very broad harmonies against it, which would create... That's intriguing because that's an idiom that I haven't ventured into yet. Didn't he once say something very nice about you, Prince? Yeah, he says nice things about me from time to time. What does he say? Well, it's not for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're going to keep it a secret. No, I, I can't even... No, he just was... He was a very good PR agent for me at one point. You know, drops my name in his songs and so on. It's very nice of him. Do you think that maybe this time you will be able to, to get together with him and actually collaborate? We'll see, you know, what happens. But, you know, in answer to your question, which direction will I go in? Well, there are all these possibilities. I've always wanted to do something very minimal with Miles, for instance. You know, maybe just voice and guitar and trumpet. Very small. Or maybe to put together a band like Manu Katché, um on drums. I mean, there's... I have a lot of ideas, but they're all, diff you know all idiomatically different. I don't know.